Few mountains anywhere in the world have inspired the same feelings as the Cairngorms. They epitomise the wild and unspoiled nature of the Scottish Highlands. I think, in fact, that man probably evolved in wild places and needs wild places to have peace of mind. This land is more or less as nature left it, and it's got wild qualities that you can't get lower down. Now that the motor car has brought people in, now that people have become more equal, I think we've got to accept a certain measure of people coming. And if we want the isolation, we'll have to go somewhere else. I'm sorry about that, but that's how it is. The point is that we do have a tremendous amount of, uh, of open space. We have an average population density of only 23 people to the square mile. I think we're really delinquent. It's really pretty shaming to go abroad and sometimes to sort of help other people in setting up national parks and so on when we just haven't managed to preserve our own bits of wilderness here. In the Cairngorms there are various problems and always there's a public interest versus a private interest, a broad interest versus a narrower one. And always the public interest loses out despite all the so-called protection. Britain is prosperous and overcrowded. Only a few corners of our island are still remote and free of commercial developments. The Cairngorms have been the subject of conflicts for half a century. The battle has raged over what is best for places like this. Are they a national resource ripe for development or should they be carefully protected for the sake of future generations? It's a question that's being asked about many of the world's wild places. But here in Scotland, some answers are now urgently needed. In the long term, neither nature conservation nor economic prosperity can be guaranteed under present policies. And while no one body is responsible for the Cairngorm area, there will continue to be a storm on the mountain. While the Cairngorm area covers 1,500 square miles in northeast Scotland, only the central core is protected as a national nature reserve. Close by are a forest park and several sites of special scientific interest. The concentration of these protected areas shows the importance of the whole Cairngorm area as part of our national heritage. Yet even this jewel in the conservation crown is a patchwork of natural and man-made features. One of the oldest methods of land management here is the careful maintenance of heather moorland, the ideal habitat for one native species that will never be extinct, the red grouse. First need, have you got that? Five. In Italy, I have a place where I shoot uh, pheasants. I've been shooting partridges in Spain. I'm shooting uh, doves in the United States. It's the only spot I like <laughs> shooting. Front, front. the only one bird that is, cannot be grown artificially, cannot be raised. So that is giving you the pleasure of shooting really a wild bird. Secondly, it is a bird that is very fast uh, and quite difficult to shoot. Uh, and that makes uh, the game even more interesting. This is a sport for the very rich. On the Invercald estate, the guests pay $5,000 a week their host, one of the 50 richest men in the country and responsible for nearly 200 square miles, is Captain Alwyn Compton Farquharson. So how's it going, Captain? Well, these are early days at the start of the season. I think it's going quite well, really. Um, people haven't looked at the grass for over a year, and as you can see for yourself, they fly pretty fast with the wind behind them, so it takes a little while to get your eye in. But we've seen a reasonable number, I think. I think you have to see them quick enough to get uh, your shots off in front rather than turning around and facing behind. That's too late. <laughs> and it takes practice to know what you're looking for. If you haven't done it very often, they're 
A difficult sea coming in low against the heather. And grouse shooting, for instance, sprang to much greater importance at the end of the Victorian times from then on. And in later times, of course, it's become a very important economic side of things for foreign visitors bringing in foreign currency and this kind of thing. And my family has lived here for a very long time. I, was, I suppose almost for five centuries now. And uh, therefore, one has got a lot of the past behind one, historically, so to speak. I've always been close to the land myself, and I've tried to learn as much as I can in my time, and to pass on, perhaps to the future, uh, the best management that I, I'm able to adopt. Well, this is one of the most important parts of hill management. The birds, of course, the grouse feed on heather almost entirely, and uh, they're not like a chicken. They don't put their head down on the ground and peck. They pick the, the heather just about the height they stand. And you want young heather, therefore, although you want some older heather for, for protection as well. And so uh, the time to do this is when the spring is on, before the sap starts to flow in the plant. In the trophy room at Invercauld, Captain Farquharson's guests are enjoying social intercourse with the aristocracy. After all, they've paid handsomely for the privilege. I like it. Tomorrow they'll try their hand at deer stalking, their own business, you might think. But in maintaining these sporting facilities, many estates have made themselves unpopular on the hills and in the forest. The main problem at the moment is the number of red deer which graze in the forest. Numbers are very high, probably much higher than they've ever been before. And they are eating all the young pines as they come up, and even worse, all the birch and rowans. The natural forest is dominated by Scots pine, but other trees grow here too, aspen, birch, alder and rowan. All these trees have one problem in common, their seedlings are very attractive to deer, especially in the spring when there's little other food about. Three winters ago this ancient Scots pine was blown over in a storm and of course the exposed soil is ideal for regeneration. This little Scots pine was the first one to grow two summers ago. But of course, last winter, along come the deer and eat the top out. The trees here are about 200 years old, but there's no regeneration. There's just far too many deer. And in the end, as you see in the back, the trees die and the forest is on its way out. But as soon as you put up a fence, and here we have a forest fence, the regeneration comes away because the deer are not there to kill off the trees as they come up. And the result is fantastic. But so much of the original forest has been lost that it's a formidable task. In the long term, we need it over the whole of the landscape, going right up into the mountains. And so the real answer is to get the deer numbers down and the grazing pressure off for a sufficient time to allow the forest to regenerate. And once it's growing healthily again, then of course the deer can get back and they can't do the damage. I think deer numbers have increased you don't want more deer, then you can, the ground will support. And although in the summertime there is plenty of grazing really for large numbers of animals, it really is governed mostly by what is available in the winter. And the reason we feed, of course, is to keep them in by so that they don't go where they're not wanted and maraud. And nothing would advertise the excessive numbers more than having herds of starving deer invading lowland farms. I think feeding is a very important part of the proper deer management and it does keep your stags in and it improves the quality and you are able to control the management much, much better. In 1967 when we counted this deer block first, we had 8,000 stags, about 11,000 hinds, a total population of about 20, just over 20,000. We recounted it in 1983 and there are 33,000 total. The stag stock has gone up slightly to about 11,000. The hind stock has almost doubled. 
We want to see the estate taking a much more realistic cull of hinds. The present legislation really only allows us to set up control schemes if crops are being damaged or the deer stock is under stress. So it is true, it's very difficult to persuade the states to raise their culling effort and to reduce numbers if we're not getting complaints from the peripheral people. And the landscape isn't only threatened by the deer. Modern stalking practices leave their mark too. If you look at this here, for example, you can see this tremendous landscape scar due to a bulldozed track. When I first came to the Cairngorms, there was practically none of this. And this has all been done without any effective planning control. You know, if you want to build a hen house in your back garden, tremendous planning control. If you want to take a bulldozer and put it 10 miles up a glen or somewhere and do this sort of thing, nobody can stop you. Who are the people doing it? Basically the states, and they've done it for a reason. They haven't done it out of malice. They have a change in the kind of hunting client, the kind of stocking client who comes, and they don't want to walk. Some of the effects are immediately obvious. The striking landscape scarring, which stays there for decades. Very often, old footpaths, ancient footpaths that have been enjoyed by generations of people are ripped out and replaced by these really unpleasant muddy troughs. The remote wild country that I knew in the Cairngorms when I first came here, and which larger and larger number of people in our modern world feel a need of, more and more young people turn to it for adventure, and it's going. And it's going not least because of the way these roads have been allowed to penetrate further and further into it, so that there's less and less remote wild country. In 1960, large parts of the Cairngorms were still more than two miles from any road. But since then, these remote areas have dwindled alarmingly because of these bulldozed tracks. Among the first to notice this trend are walkers in search of solitude and wide open spaces. On another part of Captain Farquharson's estate, these less wealthy visitors have paid nothing to enjoy the hills. After a six-hour hike into one of the most distant parts of the range, they'll spend the night out on the mountain. You're getting away from everyone, uh, and you're not going to a crag with loads of other people on it, just being in a place where I mean, you're unlikely to meet any other climbers on the climb you do, even on the walk in and out. It's, it's very unlikely you'll meet other people, unless it's a very busy day in summer. So it's just, just the quietness of it. Bivouacking in the open at 3,000 feet is not everyone's idea of fun, even in August. But for many hill lovers, there's nothing to beat it. If it's good weather for climbing, I'll go climbing. If it's good weather for bird watching, I'll go bird watching. If it's good for skiing, I'll go skiing. But it's opportunism. And the Scottish climate, it's all about opportunism. I've been coming here since I was about 14. And uh, it's just... It's really good getting here and n nobody else being here, you know? And uh, the isolation in this quarry is much more than most in the Cairngorms. I feel maybe in another five, ten years' time, when new roads, kind of, if they put new roads through, it would just totally destroy it. Take this valley down to our left here. If you put a road up, up in there, you'd have to have a car park in the bottom. Doubtless you'd have to have rangers, you know, people building footpaths. I mean, it would just totally spoil the whole area. And as for these bulldozed roads they're making up in the hills nowadays, they're a real disaster. I think if the place stays as it is here, with no extra access, then I don't think it'll be a problem for a while yet. But if you walk over to Ben McDewey, there's litter and clothing and things, I mean, every hundred yards, all the way over to Ben McDewey. And that's, I mean, a really high mountain. And it used to be quite inaccessible, but, you know, it's so easy to get there. And I think you'd find the same here. Lots of people, lots of litter. Yeah, you're talking about the mountain plateau here up on the top. It's one of the few examples of uh, land which has not been affected by man, west in Britain. You know, the parts you're talking about are sea cliffs or 
sea marsh, salt marsh, something like that, and they're all gone. You can get the stalkers complaining about climbers moving stags, but you can get, you know, climbers complaining about stalkers putting them off ground and stuff like that. You know, I think you've just got to look for a happy medium. I can see the other side of things. I do a lot of skiing, downhill skiing, and uh, I've been out shooting and that with the keepers and that. So, you know, I can do a bit of everything. Mountaineers have been visiting the Cairngorm since the last century, and societies like the Cairngorm Club and the North East Mountain Trust have campaigned to protect the area and its wild features. In recent years, members of the club have become increasingly concerned about the deterioration of many aspects of the mountain environment. They're all fighting for their own cause, in their own little niche. And blame and counter-blame, I think, is bandied to and fro rather wildly and rather without thought. And I think it's time we all need to sit down, get our acts together, and decide what we want to conserve, why we want to conserve it, and for whom we want to conserve it. I think it's the closest thing we've got in this country to a true Arctic wilderness. It's an Arctic barren, which has been moved a few hundred miles further south. We are uh, interested in the way that humans affect the ecology of the plateau, because over the last couple of decades, there's been a massive increase in human disturbance on the plateau and we're interested in finding out what effect that disturbance is having on the general ecology of the area. Since the chairlift was built, large numbers of people visit the high plateau all year round. Part of the mountain plateau project is to measure the effects. Well, I've laid out experimental plots in each of the major plant communities on the hill and each of these plots is divided into six sections and I'm subjecting each of these sections to a controlled level of trampling. Now this first section gets 1,000 tramples, like so. This is a turning area. Now the next section up gets 500 tramples, this section here. Again a turning area. The next section up gets only 250 tramples, like so. Most importantly, what the experiment shows is just how fragile these high altitude plant communities are. Now, this particular plot was trampled over a year ago, and still the 1,000 trample section is showing complete dieback. The 250 is showing fairly substantial damage. Just to put that in some sort of context, on a fine summer's day, like today, up to a thousand people can walk onto the summit of Cairngorm. Any kind of new roads or access which makes it easier to get to a place uh, will bring extra people there who wouldn't have gone there if it wasn't for the easy access. There's no argument at all for saying, put a fence up and keep people out. The, the argument is that people should work to get here and will then appreciate the, the things that are here, and the things that are here will then be maintained for future generations. In spite of this probably being Britain's premier uh, national nature reserve, we know very little about the ecology of the place. We know a bit about the, uh, some of the birds, we know something about the plants, but we know next to nothing about the invertebrates, or in fact the way these invertebrates and the birds fit into <coughs> their environment. So we're trying to plug up some of these gaps. Oh, 
There aren't very many animals easily found here. Uh, one of the obvious things to do is to look under rocks and mo any movable stones. And that actually is what most people who came here in the early days did. And they found a rather limited number of animals. And what I've found is that, although that is an important way of finding animals, uh, you also need to use some other methods. In particular, you need to collect samples of the vegetation and you need to put out traps. You need to put out little jars um, for animals to fall into. It's the combination of landforms, plants and animals that have evolved together that makes the place unique. The insects and spiders are of special interest. Quite a proportion of them are unusual in that they're not found anywhere else in Britain, or at least perhaps here and a few other high altitude places. And some of them are rather spectacular in their distribution. For example, they include species that occur in uh, Iceland, Spitsbergen, sometimes Greenland or Arctic Lapland, and here, but nowhere else. Feeding on these myriad small creatures is the rare and elusive dotterel, one of the only birds that's completely at home on the high plateau. Scientists are urgently studying its breeding habits. They take great care and spend as short a time as possible at any one nest. We're trying to find out where the birds are breeding on the plateau. So we go around most of the day looking for nests and that nest we've found already. First of all, we're going to measure the eggs to start with and take photographs of the eggs usually. There's the first egg. 8.3 by 27.6. Any signs of starting? Mm -hmm. Not in the first egg. We also weigh the eggs when we can, obviously not in this wind, but we do that to find out the density of the egg, which will give us a good idea of when the nest is due to hatch. And then we can come back and find out for sure if it's hatched in that period and get a bit much better idea of the hatching success. Snowfall is heavy on the plateau, and some of it lies in drifts till late August. Cross-country skiers come up here in early summer, but they aren't the only people interested in these late snow fields. Philip Ashmole came up here and found the snow covered with dead insects. They turned out to be almost entirely animals which had been blown up uh, from the lowlands around, um, landed accidentally on the snow fields, got chilled by the snow and unable to move, and uh, died there. And I then discovered uh, that there were, in fact, a number of carnivorous animals, particularly ground beetles, coming out, particularly at night, onto these snow fields and searching for these uh, moribund animals and, and eating them. Not everyone who comes up on the plateau stays the night, especially with a gale blowing and the temperature well below freezing. But Philip Ashmole is on the track of a true Arctic beetle, and nothing will hold him back. If I'm lucky, um, there are occasionally a beetle. Oh, here's one. Walking over the snow fairly slowly. I'm going to collect it because there are actually two species which come out on the snow and they can't be distinguished except under the microscope. And one of them is very interesting because it is only found around snow fields and actually occurs only in a very few high mountains in Britain, otherwise it's an entirely arctic species. Oh, quite a little group here. It's the peak time of night. They're moving quite fast. I try to walk a, a set route several times during the course of the night, uh, counting all the beetles I see. And I've sometimes found as many as, um, what, 70 or 80 in a half-hour period. 